Live from the back of Ruth the Realtor's car, it's the Stacking Deed Show. I'm Ruth's neighbor and part-time mechanic, Doug, broadcasting live from the spacious, luxurious Trunk Recording Studio. Get ready for a game-changing new year, new real estate you episode. We chat with investor Sudi Rao and uncover the foolproof steps to mastering deal analysis. Suni spills the beans on her tried and true formula for securing brilliant investments. You won't believe what you've been missing. In our headlines, we explore if the math for buying a home is still mathing. Are mortgage payments climbing faster than rent payments? Let's help you combat that. Plus, we'll take a question from a deeder, and in true New Year resolution form, we'll give your brain a real estate workout with my property pop quiz. And now, two perpetually re-gifted misfit toys, it's Crystal Hammond and Joe Saul Cihai. Howdy. Happy New Year, Joe. Happy New Year to you, Crystal. Imagine you and I in the back of the car riding around in 2024. We're riding in 2024. It feels like we're riding in the future. I know. We are. <laughs> it is funny. I can't believe I haven't done this yet, but I've been meaning to ask Doug from that Parents Just Don't Understand song. I dare you to go up to Ruth and say... Drive fast, speed turns me on. <laughs> oh, God, I'm never saying anything like that to Ruth. Oh, my God, no. Oh. Maybe like 50 years ago. Ruth might have had game 50 years ago, but no, not right now. What a bad way to start a new year, Crystal. Oh, it was a, what a funny joke. I thought it was hilarious. As usual. That was the end of Terrifying Doug's 20, if you're in my shoes. End of Doug's 2024 right there. Well, we are going to kick this off in a great way, though. We've got Suni Rao with us. Suni not only was a professional tennis player, she's a professional real estate investor, Crystal, and she's going to go over her five steps to analyze a property to see if this is worth buying. I love it. And you know how we love steps. We love math. We like when the math is mathing. So <laughs> this is always your first step when you want to figure out, all right, is this a do or is this a don't? Well, especially when you're starting out, you want to buy every house. You'll find a way to make it fit in your brain, right? Your brain will tell you, no, I can make this with this is great. And you don't want to fall in love. You do not want to fall in love with the property. No. You want your checkbook to fall in love with the property. You want your balance sheet exactly. to fall in love. By the way, if you're a short-term renter person, this episode might not be for you. This is for our long-term crowd, right? I mean, this is totally crystal. We're looking at this through the long-term lens today. Right, because there are a lot of benefits to going for the long-term. And you'll also have a different strategy and things to budget for when you're going long-term versus short-term rental. We got all that, but first we have a headline. So let's get the 2024 party started. Started, shall we? This comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This is written by Carol Ryan. There has never been a worse time to buy instead of rent. It's now 52% more expensive to buy a home than rent one because of climbing mortgage rates. This is actually from late last year, but interest rates really came down after this piece was written. But it's still, mm -hmm. Crystal, for a lot of people who are just trying to buy their primary residence, this is not a phenomenal time for them to purchase a house. Well, this is one of the reasons why we love, even if you're buying your first primary residence, that it's a house hack, that it is a duplex or a multi-unit, something that is going to bring in income that is going to pay most of that mortgage for you. So this is a great story just to show you what your strategy should be when you're trying to get your first investment property. Or even if you're looking for a primary, make sure that it's something that's a multi-unit or a house hack. I think that's great because in 2023, we listed house hacking as our number one best way to get started, yeah. right? So for our deeders out there, if you don't own anything yet, house hacking, where you either rent out, have a roommate. It could be a finished basement, ADU, additional dwelling unit, some way to rent out a part of your property. I don't want a roommate, so it would have to be a 
two unit at least for me, or maybe a finished basement with a complete walkout. So we're not sharing anything. That would be my preferred next. You're kind of adamant about that. I feel like there's a backstory about bad roommates. <laughs> no, it's just I have my own preferences, and you really need to get to know a person. I remember arguing with my roommate about pancake mix one time because <laughs> we spent too much time together. <laughs> That's what happened when you spend too much time with a person. That's funny. My roommate, we were I hanging feel like out. We need to know more about that, Joe. <laughs> well, we were. <laughs> Yeah. We were, is it like more about the, the pancake? Uh, were you uh, pissed about like well, the no all in one complete is better than Bisquick where you got to bring all the other ingredients? How could you possibly argue about that? Well, it was dumb. We were in college at the time and I spent my money on more pancake mix instead of the actual price to get into the club that night. And I was like, listen, I'd rather have pancakes. <laughs> and our poor other friend came over and she was like, listen, I'm not here to be a referee. I'm just here to hang out because, of course, as soon as someone would come over, we'd be like, hey, is this stupid? Listen to this. And so we would, you know, try to get her to pick a side on who was dumb. And all of our <laughs> listeners who are above college age right now all agree you absolutely should spend your money on pancakes instead of getting into the club. Exactly. My roommate, who we got back together, I happened to be back in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where he lives a few months ago. We reprised our fight over milk and about how dumb. We had the dumbest fight. <laughs> or He had bought milk twice in a row and I did not notice. And he was very upset that he had to buy it twice in a row and he was about to buy it a third time and Joe had notice yet wait a minute when you say reprise does that mean like the argument kept going and you were coming to blows over no this? we laughed about how dumb it was we just oh, okay, he, okay. he actually Remember brought it time. up he's like i still feel like i was an ass when i went i'm like no i'm pretty oblivious <laughs> i'm pretty oblivious did you hand him three dollars and 89 cents i think i did i think i totally that. did dude i went to my wallet and i'm like here i got the next five milks like i will buy the next seven milks if we just don't have this <laughs> argument anymore up. Yes. Fun that times. is hilarious. I had a roommate. She noticed that I played her CDs while she was gone. And she's like, CDs are very expensive. And if you break one, you're going to have to replace it. So just don't touch my CDs. And I was like, whoa, sorry. Well, now that we've proven to people that having a roommate's awesome, <laughs> and this is the way that you should probably go, we got to do better on the average. House hacking is wonderful. You know, besides the CD fight and the milk fight and the pancake fight, it's great. But I do think, uh, Crystal, there's a couple things going on. Number one is this can help you we're going to talk to suny about the deal in a house hack if you expect mm -hmm. to pay a mortgage anyway you can be a little bit underwater at the beginning of a deal and then when interest rates drop again like they will at some point you then lock in a better rate later i mean instead of it subsidizing all of your rent all of your mortgage payment maybe it cuts your piece of the mortgage in half because interest rates are higher i think there's another piece to this though which is, I think our dealers got to remember you're on the other side of this now. It's a great thing. Like when you're between tenants and you're marketing for new tenants, marketing the fact that there's never been a worse time to buy, you should come rent from me, is another piece of this. Like I think a lot of the time we're like, oh, interest rates are high. This is going to suck. No, 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 if you already own property, this is good for you. People want to rent right now and you can be on that train going, hey, rent from me. Please rent from me. Oh, yeah, it's a lot cheaper. And this also takes care of high vacancy rates, too, of having properties sit empty. And this is a great marketing tool because a lot of times people have bought back when interest rates were low. So not much has changed. You want a small time person anyway, instead of going with the big wigs because they just unnecessarily raise your rent for no reason. And I'll give you a free turkey once a year. <laughs> well, it's funny you say free turkey because the thing that this brings up for me is when people think about about advertising real estate and the fact that you have a vacancy we advertise the same stuff like everybody advertises the same. you look at one listing then the next listing yeah. and then the next listing and it's funny because I remember talking to a couple different marketing gurus who were like the key to a great advertisement is to not say what everybody else is saying you have to look at what they say and find a way mm -hmm. to do something different as an example you only have so much if you're a mechanic you own an auto repair shop like how many auto repair shops has this thing been in like a bajillion. I mean, 88 Lincoln Town Car. I got to think, Ruth, you've had this in the, oh, she's not oh, yeah. listening to us. <laughs> but you just think that if you own a repair shop, what's the first thing you always see in a repair shop ad? ASC certified. 
you always see ASC certified. I have no idea what ASC yeah. certified means, Crystal. I have no idea what it is. Me neither. And this marketing guru goes, everybody expects you to be ASC certified. Everybody thinks you are, even if it's just an assumptive, why you waste valuable space in your advertising to say ASC certified versus we take care of our customers. We have a hundred percent money back guarantee. If your shocks don't work and you happen to live through it, uh. like, you'll be taken care of by us. And for people like me, free food, free tea, free snacks. That'll get me in yeah. to your repair <laughs> shop. I don't care if you fix my car. <laughs> Give me pancakes. We spoil our customers. <laughs> you can we tell spoil we're our customers. recording this around breakfast time because Crystal's all about the food. <laughs> yes, I like food. Definitely. But I think that that is important when you're doing your listing. Give it a little, nice little spin. Put a little extra on it. And if you don't know how to do that, I think, Crystal, this is a great thing where you can throw it into ChatGPT. Or if you had ChatGPT oh, yeah. create it, just say, hey, can you say this in a more creative way? Can you say this in a funnier way? Can you say this in a, you know, just keep giving it some uh, standout-ish. Yeah. And we can cover this next week in our Ask ChatGPT episode, <laughs> too. Great foreshadowing. Next episode. <laughs> it's our job to train you. Right. Next episode, we are asking ChatGPT. <laughs> this is our way to train you. Real estate questions. We're going to see what yes. ChatGPT gives us yep. back. That'll be a good time. But today, Crystal, we have a fantastic guest that we're going to be hopefully picking up here along the road. Suni Rao is a big time real estate investor. She focuses on Indianapolis. We'll talk to her hopefully about how she did that, how she built her empire. But the big thing we wanted to talk about is Suni's looked at a ton of deals and she understands that it takes a while. You're going to have to evaluate a lot of stuff, but you have to also be able to evaluate it quickly. If you're in a market where interest rates are high, you're going to have to be able to go, that's not it. That's not it. That, ooh, this might be it. And dive in. You can't spend tons of time on every single listing to see if it actually fits your portfolio. She's going to talk about that. But first, I think, Doug, you've got today's pop quiz. Hey there, Dieters. I'm Ruth Wrench, wielding repair guru, neighbor Doug. It's pretty exciting to have Suni Rao joining Joe and Crystal up there in the Brighton comfortable part of the car, you know, up there where they have the luxury of seeing without a flashlight and, you know, not breathing their own carbon dioxide all day long. I really shouldn't have had that Taco Bell. What a lot of people don't know about SUNY is that her first moonshot to success was as a professional tennis player. In honor of her hitting a ball millions of times and grunting, let's talk about another person who took a moonshot. There's some real estate we all want, the moon. Imagine if you built a short-term rental there. Zero competition. Sure, maybe it's a little difficult to get to, and there's that whole no oxygen thing, but a few of those air canisters and some zip-up tents to keep it all enclosed, and we're good. Well, it was on this day in 1835, the first photo of the moon was taken by one of the earliest pioneers in photography. What was his name? Oh, come on, he's super famous. You don't think you got a shot at this, but when you hear the answer, you're gonna make more noise than Suni did when she double faulted. I'll be back right after I get some fresh oxygen. Seriously, what is a chalupa anyways? All right, Dieters, it's me, Alan Corey, Real Estate Maximalist. Don't tell Crystal and Joe, but this is my favorite part of the podcast where I bring you today's real estate tip of the day. Here's the easiest way to become a real estate millionaire. If you've got the time and the flexibility, it's amazing. Get a $300,000 small multifamily. It could be a duplex, triplex, or a quadruplex. You live in one unit and you collect rental income in the other unit. Why this is great? Well, if it's done right and the numbers work in your favor, it'll be cheaper than renting. That rental income offsets your mortgage payment, potentially all of your mortgage payment. But here's how the millionaire aspect comes in. Historically, housing goes up 3.5%. If you just wait for 30 years, your 30-year mortgage gets paid off, a $300,000 purchase price becomes a paid-off $1 million asset, and that rental income from those other units is going straight to your pocket because you have no mortgage payment and you're a millionaire with a paid off asset that's paying you. Doesn't get any better than that. And that's today's House Money Media real estate tip of the day. If you're craving more real estate education, 
then head over to housemoneymedia.com to check out my real estate coaching and courses. Use coupon code DEEDS for 10% off all of our products so you can learn everything you need to know about long-term and short-term rentals, whether you're investing locally or out of state. That is DEEDS, D-E-E-D-S, for 10% off for all Stacking Deeds listeners only at housemoneymedia.com. Hey there, Dieters. I'm professional mooner and former eighth grade tennis team alternate, Roots Mechanic, neighbor Doug. In the dawn of the burgeoning science of photography, one name comes up again and again as a pioneer. That dude in France just couldn't stop thinking of new things to take pics of. There were street scenes in Paris, beautiful countrysides, and the moon. No, not that moon. That came later with the invention of the photocopier. This father of photography took his first picture of the moon on January 2nd, 1835. Sadly, just two months later, a fire broke out in his studio, destroying all of his early work. What was the name of the man considered the father of photography? It was none other than Louis Daguerre. At least that's what his buddies called him. You know, as in the daguerreotypes you saw whenever your third grade class visited a museum. The ones where nobody's smiling because their wives made them get all dressed up for a stupid holiday card picture. Yeah, that guy. And now, let's get you back to Crystal and Joe talking to a force so powerful in the real estate industry that she creates her own gravitational pull. It's Suni Rao. Crystal, look at, is that Suni over there? I think it is Suni. What's she doing here? Hold on a second. Ruth, pull over. Ruth, you right there. Suni, what are you doing here? What is up? <laughs> Meet you on the you? side of the road in Texarkana. Yeah, anyway. Who would have thought? I, I didn't know you hitchhiked. That's you did cool. I learn something new every day. <laughs> And even though I'm here, I still don't believe Texarkana is a real place. I still oh, think easy. Joe is making the word up. Come it on. always sounds like to Durkin. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> Texarkana. <laughs> well, we're super happy you're here. You're probably looking for great real estate deals because they're all here in Texarkana, SUNY. But you're going to help us determine what's a good deal and what isn't some of the traps people fall into. But let's start here with your deals. How many different deals do you think you've looked at? in real estate God, hundreds <laughs> literally hundreds especially before the first deal because when you're doing the first deal you're like moving from like this abstract theory you learned about to practical application and like crystal doesn't believe texarkana is real it's hard to believe that real estate investing is real <laughs> when you're doing that first deal. so you just keep looking and you're like does this work and then none of the numbers pencil out because especially if you started recently, like the last five, six, seven years, like the market's gone up, but it's always been competitive, so competitive. Yeah. And so there's a yeah. lot of homes on the market that don't make sense from an investment perspective. So the whole time you're like, okay, I'm in Wonderland. This doesn't actually work until you finally realize it does work and you kind of narrow down your criteria and then the momentum begins. That's good to know because I think a lot of people think I'm going to look at maybe five, six deals before I find my first house. But you're saying this could be, you could look at a hundred deals. I mean, you could, especially if you're nervous or if you have a little bit of analysis paralysis or you kind of want to be sure. And I mean, honestly, you could look at dozens of deals even after you do your first three, four, five. Like it is not easy to find things that not only work, but work for you in terms of the numbers and your situation. It's kind of a holistic, there are a set of holistic needs that you typically have to meet when buying a property. And this is important for our dealers too, because we don't want them to have buyer's remorse. That's almost the opposite of analysis paralysis. Cause right. when you're like, oh man, I found this way too fast. It's like, yeah, it's probably too good to be true. And that looking at a hundred makes way more sense than, oh man, this first deal is perfect. Let's hop in. Absolutely. And then you also need to learn to run the numbers. I think as you yeah. see deals come and go, and maybe if you don't 
act on the first one or two and then you look at like their sales price after and that can kind of like help you realize hmm I wonder what that person's strategy was like I wonder like what can be done with this property that would allow this person to make money which then can lead into how much you end up offering down the road that is interesting I want to dive into that in a second we had last week is our last episode of 2023 we had our interview with David Green oh. from Bigger Pockets and I know you were on Bigger Pockets we're gonna to link to that episode so people can hear your complete story soon but let's do the shorthand here. How many properties do you own and how long did it take you to get there? So I started investing in spring of 2018 as a long distance invest real estate investor from Boston. Mm -hmm. I was living in Boston, investing in Indianapolis. Over the last five years, five years and change, I have now a portfolio of 10 doors. I've done other transactions. I sold a couple properties. I wholesale the mobile home park once, which is kind oh, of- Oh, nice. Yeah. Whole park. Is, I always bring that up because it's like the most ridiculous thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> I learned so much. Okay, we got to stop there for a second. Yes. Did this just fuck? If you wholesaled it, oh. like my son wholesaled one a couple of years ago, where the deal just kind of fell in his lap, he didn't have room for it, mm -hmm. so he turned it around really quick. Yeah, that was kind of what happened. So the deal came to me through a social media contact, someone I met on Instagram, whose father wanted to sell the mobile home park he held for this whole time, and I was like well, I've heard mobile home parks are recession resistant. I should probably look at it, which <laughs> was basically the voice I used through the next two months, you know, as I had to figure, <laughs> figure out this entire game. I'm not sure if I should. Maybe, <laughs> yes, you should. No, you should. Yes, I should. And so it was like an hour, no, I think it was like two hours away in the next largest town in Indiana called Evansville. And so I didn't have the money for it. I met someone through the podcast that I do who want to be like the money person in the deal and I'd be the boots on the ground. And so I drove out there one day with two of my buddies. I was like January 1st. So like two of them were like hungover slash fasting for some reason <laughs> on New Year's Day. And I'm sitting in the back trying to eat cashews really quietly to not upset their hangover slash fast. And we go to this mobile home park and it is chaos. It is like oh, falling wow. apart. Like if you want, I can send you pictures, like if you want to put on the yes. show notes, but literally like it was such a mess. It was just people hadn't, like the rents hadn't been increased in like more than a decade. And while oh. that might've been good for the tenants that were living there, when you don't increase rents and expenses mm. increase, that means that the place isn't maintained because there's no funds left to maintain it, right? And so that very much showed there was like one home where there was a big window and instead of a curtain, there was a broken TV, like as a curtain. And I was like, oh boy, oh boy. Wow. And wow. then like, there was another one that I like climbed into when I visited later with my money partner and I climbed back out and then the manager came out and he was like, no, no, don't go in there. And I was like, too late. Uh... And he was like, we think that was a meth lab. And I was like, come on down. <laughs> I'm jumping out, catch me. <laughs> I'm still here. I thought Sunny's about to tell us that's when she started her new side hustle. <laughs> right. A little bit of breaking bad action. Right. Um, so anyway, long story short, this needed a certain skill set that I was not sure that I could learn and deploy because it was two hours from my place. I had my own rentals. I was still working a full-time job. And so I was like, okay, I just need to get rid of this thing. But when I entered into the contract to get it under contract, I kind of knew that this might happen. There's a chance that this might happen. So I made sure to have the purchase agreement written with like my LLC, but I think the terminology was like, or assignable to or something like that. There's a way to write that language. And that allowed me to find another buyer for the contract when I decided like it wasn't for me. And I made sure to really negotiate the price hard. So it would be a really good deal so that I could find another buyer if I needed to. So I was able, once I decided that it was actually so funny because like someone else on Instagram messaged me and was like, Hey, I see what you're doing with the mobile home parks. We'd love to chat with you. Like blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay. And so like big on networking, picked up the phone, called him and he's like, Oh, so how's that going? And I'm like, well, I hate it. I don't want to do this. <laughs> I need to find someone to buy this. And he's like, Oh, I'll buy it. And so he ended up buying it and getting, I got an assignment fee that I shared with my partner and I got a little bit larger chunk of the fee because I'd done a lot of like the groundwork. I climbed mm. into the meth lab. <laughs> <laughs> got <Yes>. hazard pay. <laughs> my groundwork, right. window work, <laughs> chemistry work. Yeah. So Jeez. yeah, that's that story. <laughs> 
Wow. You know what I like about that though, Crystal? I mean, I love Sunni saying that, you know, know your lane, stay in your lane, yeah. get good at one thing, like really feel the heartbeat of that thing. And if you can't feel the heartbeat, even if it's a great, great idea, looks like a good idea. I mean, you know, there's shiny objects all over the place that can detract us from what our journey really should be. Well, there's so many lessons in that story too, even about being able to assign it and negotiating your butt off, your almost meth blown off butt off. <laughs> To get the, a good price. And then you shared it. So someone else was like, hey, what are you doing with that? I keep wanting to say meth lab trailer park. I mean, yeah. So you were able to offload it because you were just sharing your journey. Yeah. And I think it's really important anytime you look to invest in something. Joe, you say this all the time, begin with the end in mind, you know, and so you need to know when investing that not all ends are good ends. And so you need to be prepared for if the end is not all sunshine and rosy and grassy oh, yeah. fields, whatever it is. Well, and on that note, begin with the end in mind. A lot of people say that the deal is done. Buying the wrong property leads you down the wrong road. Buying the right place, you lock in your profit from the moment that you sign on the dotted line, if you sign on the right place. So when you're looking for a good deal, let's talk about the filters that you use. What filters are most important for you when you're evaluating a property and whether it's a fit in your portfolio? So I want to win no matter what happens. And there's several ways that your wallet benefits from a real estate investment, right? So spoken like a pro tennis player, by the way, <laughs> I want to win no matter what. Just a little competitive over here. Uh, <laughs> I'd be sorry. Yes. No, but that's huge. Continue. I'm yeah. sorry. So the two concepts of winning no matter what and your wallet benefiting, I'll link the two. So first, let's talk about how your wallet benefits, right? You have the cash flow, you have the tax benefits, you have appreciation. And so I want to make sure I hit all of those when I buy a property so that if I cannot hold on to it, then I can sell it right away for a profit. And I want to know how the tax benefits would would benefit me so that that can help me make a decision in the long term. So like tax benefits, long term capital gains, short term, what have you, figure out how that works so that if I need to hold on to it for a year, then it can still cash flow. And if all goes well and I can hold on to it forever, cool. It's just going to keep cash flowing the whole time. So metrics to get there. Let's dive into those metrics. How do you go through the numbers to make sure that it's going to cash flow? So there is the mortgage. The PITI, so you want to make sure you know what that could be with the current interest rate. You can find that through like, there's a lot of amortization calculators. Talk to an insurance agent. <laughs> insurance is always, especially yeah. these days, more expensive than you think. It's gone up in the last couple of years. You wanna know what your taxes are. In certain area, the taxes change between if you're a homeowner living in the property or you're an investor holding the property. In Indianapolis, for example, the tax rate changes from like 1% of the assessed value to 2% of the assessed value when you switch from home ownership to investor held. So that can really impact cash flow. You also want to take into account vacancy at minimum 30 days. Usually if you have a good property in a good area, you can account for that 30 day vacancy every two years. A lot of times, places will not pencil out if you're turning over every year and you don't want a property that you have to turn over every year. You wanna keep that in mind when you buy the property, when you screen your tenants. And so even the 30 days, that's like pretty aggressive, you know, because it takes yeah. people time to find mm -hmm. a home to move and they're gonna be looking in advance of their current lease running out a long time. They're not gonna move in in 10 days. And it takes time for you to get contractors in there to paint the place, patch the holes, fix it up. So it's probably more like 45 days is a better estimate. And if you're going to calculate, you're gonna underwrite the property, you wanna do it on an annual basis typically. So you would just find the 45 days and divide that in half what that cost would be. I love that approach more because it's much more conservative. And hey, if things get done quicker and you're able to keep it rented more than it's extra cash versus exactly. I think what a lot of people do is they click their heels together three times and say, there's no place like perfection, you know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. You absolutely don't want to do that. You'll laugh all the way to the bank if things turn out better. And that's the position you want to be in. You never want to be in a position where like your pie in the sky scenario didn't work out. You want to be like on the worst day of my life, will this investment still be okay for me? Will it still make money or at absolute worst break even? 
On top of those numbers, so we have the mortgage, the PITI, we're looking at vacancies probably 45 days a year. I would think then you've got to have a number in there for property repairs, ongoing maintenance on top of all that too. Yeah, and that would depend on kind of like how old a property is. Sometimes there are some people who maybe, depending on the strategy, might do medium term or short term rentals. And there are people I know who do that and buy like new builds because that's what works in their area. For a new build, your CapEx budget and your repairs and maintenance budget can be lower. For an older home, you definitely want it to be higher. So I like to do like rule of thumb, 8% for each which is pretty hefty, but also keeping in mind a lot of times I buy distressed properties because that's where Mm. the true value can be added. That's where you make the money by putting in that work. So a lot of the stuff that I put in there is new. You know, I make a lot of the updates. So theoretically, my CapEx repairs should be lower, but also when you buy older homes and you do all the repairs, there's always something that you forget or something that breaks after, (laughs) you know? Sure, yeah. So there's that to keep in mind. And then the two other big- Or initially, Suni, not to cut you off, but or initially things, you discover stuff that even during the inspection you didn't know was there. Yeah. I'll give you an example. My son on a property, the grass was really long. The inspector went through the house, went through the garage, went through everything, and he decided to buy the property. When he brought somebody out there to mow the lawn, there was a car in the back of the property <laughs> that nobody saw. The grass was that long that there was <laughs> That's how wow. long the grass was. It was yeah. Worked. <laughs> There was an old Pontiac Trans Am way in the back part of the property. (laughs) This sounds like a labyrinth. I know, That's funny. It? And then he had to figure out how to, you know, take title of that so he could get rid oh, of it, which ended up being an additional pain in the ass. But anyway, yeah, he ended up with a little more money from that, which was kind of cool because the car actually ran. But that's a whole different. Hmm. St- yeah, I know. Whole different story. Huh. That's wild. Where were we? OK, yeah. And so then the last two things, which are super important, property management. Even if you want to manage mm-hmm. it yourself, always include property management fees, which at minimum are 10 percent per month. of gross rents. You don't want to necessarily be buying an investment that turns into a job that you can't get out of. You want to be able to hire it out and still make money if that's the way life turns. And then if you're gonna do that, you usually have to pay lease up fees. So remember we were calculating vacancy every other year. With every vacancy, there's a turnover. And so when you turn it over, you usually need to pay extra to get them to lease it up. And that can be anywhere from half a month's rent, gross rent, to a full month's of gross rent. So you want to throw that in the calculation bucket as well. And then how are you estimating the repairs? Like if it's over 8%, I don't want to do it because you do want sweat equity because you said you like the fixer uppers. That's where you really make a good amount of money. So like the 8% is for like the monthly cash. Ongoing. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So when it comes to like repairs at the outset, I roll that into how much the overall cost of purchase essentially will be. What will it cost me to buy the property and to get it running? And so I'll have that cost and then I'll look at like, okay, so if I have that cost, then what is my monthly payment going to be? Because there's different ways of funding that, right? If the repairs are part of like my cash that I put in and then that's it, or maybe I am purchasing the property with the HELOC and then I'll refinance later, you know? And so then there's debt on the repair. So like you want to look at that as well. It's the holistic picture. And then you also want to look at, okay, so if I'm putting this cash in, like how much money am I making back? And is this still a good idea given that if I put it in an index fund, like over X amount of years, I can get this return, you know? So you want to look at like the cash returns. You also want to look at like how much you can increase the property appreciation because that's like your overall return versus another option like stocks. You really, I think then have to drive hard into making sure that you can restore the property because I'm imagining that with the way that you're looking at deals, I mean, you're finding so much money through that restoration, which also means then SUNY that you got to have, I would think, a good team or a good idea of how much money it's going to take to do that restoration. I mean, let's say it's a $100,000 house, then you put another 40000 into the property. I would think there's a couple things going on there. You got to be sure of the 40000 number. And then second, you must be estimating how much you think you could then flip the house for if you decided not to keep it, what the end game is. Mm-hmm. 
Let's take both of those separately on the restoration. Is there a carpenter, a general contractor, somebody that you work with, or have you gotten good through YouTube university or through, <laughs> through your own <laughs> skill not. set of being able to know, you know, okay, furnace is going to cost this, the roof is going to be that. Like, how do you estimate the restoration cost? I do both. So I do have an idea of how much it will cost upon my own walkthrough. So I can be like, oh God, these cabinets are like going to fall off. I need to fall, like the doors are falling off hinges. I'm going to need new cabinets new countertops like new sick new faucet okay like cabinets will be like there's this many that'll be like maybe about five grand countertops another thousand whatever and so like I'll have this estimate that's kind of running through my head so I have a ballpark and that's enough to work with to move forward and then once I have it under contract that is when I will walk through with my contractor or I will call like if I think it needs electrical work because that's what the inspection said I'll call my electrician and be like hey what would it cost to do this and sometimes they can just give me like it'll be between this and this and so then I will verify my thoughts with actual kind of estimates with my people and the good thing is after these last five years like I have tradesmen and contractors that I can call I have at least usually one in like each specialty where I can be like homie help (laughs) come look at this roof he's gonna fall on me how did you originally find those people just uh, trial and error yeah trial and error and through friends through other investors that really kind of cut to the chase for me and still like there are people who won't follow through or won't answer etc but like it's so much easier to develop relationships, good relationships with folks who already have good relationships with people you know. Are there specific organizations and towns that you go to to forge those recommendations when you're first starting out? No, it was more like through Facebook groups, Instagram, like meeting other investors and just making friends and then be like, hey, like who do you use for this? Do you have anyone like you can share? And then like, obviously I would share my resources and we'd like go back and forth. We just like pull. That's the first question. I love getting that team together. And you even alluded to that at the beginning, Sudi, when you said that, you know, networking is a huge piece of what you do. Like being able to network and keep your eye open for deals is super important. The second thing we talked about was estimating what you get for the property. How do you do that? Do you just open up Zillow and look at what the other properties in the area are? Do you do your own comps kind of thing? I don't have a license, so I don't do my own comps. I'll start off again, like with my own research, I will look at Zillow, I will look at the other sites and see like what other properties are selling for. And then I'll call my agent and that'll be a part of our due diligence process. Like what will this be valued at when the repairs are done? And that's important whether you're holding it or whether you're selling it, because if you're holding it, then that is that equity bump, the forced appreciation that you need that will really like impact your net worth positively and also allow you to like pull out as much cash as possible if you refinance to allow like the cash on cash return to remain high. Awesome. So we went through all of your, I think, went through all of your numbers. Is there a number on top of that that you want to cash flow on top of that that's kind of either slot money or SUNY's take-home pay that's on top of that? Or if you are able to get it zeroed out after, you know, property management lease-up fees there at the end, are you good? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, Oh. I manage all of my properties myself, but yeah, I definitely just. So you're capturing the property management fee essentially. Yeah. And the lease up fee. Yeah. Okay. Another question. So since you have a realtor, how is this new rule about buyers possibly having to pay the buyer's commission? Will that change or you'll just put that into your calculations too of, okay, I got to pay a buyer's agent now, yeah, possibly. Possibly. Yeah. That's a great question. So I think that falls under like the same umbrella as, oh my God, interest rates are so high. Oh my God. Yeah. It needs a new sewer line. Yep. Oh my God. Like there are deals that make sense. You just have to underwrite yep. the costs. And if it doesn't make sense, then you move on. It can be very pragmatic. You don't want to stop because there's like a little bit of a challenge or something's going to be more expensive. The deal could still work. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. You just include that in your calculations. What's the thing you wish you knew earlier than you knew when you got into real estate? Ooh, good question. You know, it would be helpful if I knew this question before, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) I'm the master of sabotage. Exactly what we do. We get you in the back of Ruth's car and just sabotage you with the question. Our goal was to see if we could make SUNY sweat. (laughs) Honestly, I wish I knew more about the importance of like repairs and how tricky old homes can be. That has been a little bit Mm. of my downfall with a couple of properties caused me a whole lot of stress. You know, and so I wish like now if I go into a home when I'm walking it and there's like the wiring looks a little weird or like it's yeah, if it's going into like an electrical outlet, that's like kind of odd or the plumbing and it's weird and it's all kind of like looking a little jumbled. I'm like, get this 
<laughs> we're gonna back away slowly because like that's where the problems come if it's like that with what you can see you have no idea what they did where you can't see it and Yikes. like that i have so many stories i cannot even like begin that is where like repairs that need tens of thousands of dollars come in because you can't diagnose it because you don't know exactly what's going on etc cetera, etc cetera. like every home is going to be kind of difficult they're challenges but you kind of want to feel like someone took care of this home a little bit before you get into it I saw that with mm. just different types of heating in these older houses in Detroit. Mm. Like just some of these ancient heating systems. And that can be so dangerous. Yeah. yeah, these ugly forest air systems. And then you get the people out there and they're like, you yeah, haven't seen one of these in 25 years. You're like, oh, that sounds cheap. <laughs> Thanks. That sounds super cheap. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that you were able to help us today. If if people want to track you more, besides listening to you on Bigger Pockets, which is probably your second second biggest real estate interview next to this one. Absolutely. <laughs> How do people follow you, Suni? So they can find me on Instagram. My handle is Suni, S-U-N-I underscore Rao, R-A-O underscore. That's probably the best place, honestly. I have a website called Griffix Property Group, G-R-I-F-F-I-X, propertygroup.com. But yeah, Instagram is the place where I am. Awesome. Most. Well, you know what? Ooh. We'll link to both of those Ooh, on our yes, show notes. Yes, we will. This I was say so we, cool. but Crystal's going to. I know. He thinks he knows French, <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't. Oui, oui. <laughs> it's not what happens. <laughs> Sunni, thanks for hanging out with us. Now get out of yes. our car. <laughs> <laughs> What a great chat with Suni. Fabulous. Fantastic. See, and she really brought up a lot of the points that we've been trying to hit home since the beginning. First of all, like you said earlier, she focused on Indianapolis. You need to pick your comfort zone, like pick a place to focus. And then she looked at hundreds of properties. Like you're not going to find a home run the first property you look at. And if you think that's a home run, then please triple check the numbers. If you think the very first property that you looked at is your home run. So you're probably missing, right, something. You're missing something yeah. huge or you're sipping the realtor's Kool-Aid and you really need to really, really, really put on your investor and your math hat and say, okay, don't get glorified or, you know, don't get seduced by the sex words because that's another thing that happens like oh it has a balcony or oh it has this so definitely and especially if since interest rates are still high you really want this to be a deal there's still deals out there so the math will tell you if this is a deal but sometimes you're gonna have to look at hundreds of properties before you get there well, and as alan has said recently during his segment that you know there's less competition there's fewer competition fewer competitors out there so yeah uh, even while with interest rates high it's the filter great time and you can negotiate more. So go back to the Diabondi episode, to the Vicki Barron exactly. episode and dive into negotiation. By the way, if you don't get the show yep. notes now, you can subscribe to the show notes and Crystal, you're going to have all SUNY's five steps in the show notes. So if you don't get the show yes, notes, I will. you're missing out on being able to have those in a place. But where can you subscribe for the show notes? Yes, you head to stackingdeeds.net slash show notes and you will get all the exclusive super secret top secret steps deliver it to your <laughs> inbox so you can refer back to them and you can tell your friend. We got a fantastic question from Lindsay. Lindsay saw this TikTok video and actually it's funny looking at this letter. This is not so much crystal question Lindsay has, but much more just this guy's reiterating some of the stuff we talked about last year. And so let's dive in. This mm -hmm. is that guy on TikTok. Let's listen to three things wealthy real estate investors won't tell you, but I will. Maybe the worst headline ever. I hate headlines that say that, but <laughs> let's listen and see if this is what wealthy real estate investors know. Three things that wealthy real estate investors will not tell you, but I will. Number one, they have a different lens where they can see opportunity where most people don't see. For example, you see this single family home right here? Most people see a single family fixer upper, but the people who are wealthy really understand how to do this game. What they see is, wow, there's a townhouse site next door. So that means this area must be zoned townhouses. They should check the zoning because if it's the same, they can put townhouses and that's usually how you make more money than rehabbing a fixer upper like most investors do. Number two, they never tell you about this new ADU play. You guys see this nice house right here? You see it's on the corner, right? You see the backyard and you see the alley, right? 
This is where you gotta know when you're on a corner, you got an alley, and if it's single family zoning, you got a big enough backyard, which this guy do, you can put a thousand square foot ADU in the back. And why is it so beautiful? Is it on a corner and an alley? Have you have access on both sides? This is where the big money is being made. And most wealthy guy will not tell you this. Number three, they never tell you how you can finance these deals. When you buy a fixed up, you don't have to pay all cash for the property. When it's really be like this, if the purchase price is let's say four hundred thousand dollars and the rehab is fifty thousand, that's four fifty. All you need is twenty percent down of that, which is ninety thousand, and the harmony lender will finance the rest for you but all you need when you do harmony lending is you got to have an experienced contractor and you don't need good credit if you got that right there harmony lending will lend you the money to buy fix up and make money that's a lot of people will not tell you that we can talk more about hard money lending i think there's actually conventional loans if you don't want to go with hard money lending if you don't have to oh yeah if you don't have to you do not want to go with uh, larry the land shark or loan shark land shark <laughs> <laughs> Larry the loan shark. Well, and there are different reasons. There are Andy different Grimm. reasons too, because the hard money, you can get that money fast, but they're more looking at the deal, not necessarily at you too. I mean, they look at you, but they're looking at the deal. And if they see you have a great deal. And also, I'm glad that he mentioned the contractor too, because even for me, for the bank, the bank is not only looking at me, they're going to do their due diligence on the contractor the that property. I finally picked to do my build. Right. So they actually are looking out for you too. Both the banks and the art money lenders can be. But even the opportunity, I like that he talked about the opportunities because a lot of people, when you're investing, you are investing for opportunity. You're seeing something that not everyone else sees. So when you see these you know, dilapidated looking house, you're not looking for something that you necessarily want to live in. You're looking for something that has an opportunity. You get a chance to actually customize that property to make it into something that you possibly would live in or you would want to rent out. You're not looking to live in it. You're looking to invest to the specs of that particular neighborhood. You're not putting Beverly Hills in like a skid row. You know what I mean? Like you are fixing up the property to the level of the neighborhood too. So you're definitely looking for opportunity. Zones. This goes back to the phrase that Mindy Jensen that used. Yeah, it absolutely does. And Mindy Jensen, you know, I kept calling it a real mm -hmm. estate game, if you remember. And she's like, it's a business. And the biggest problem is oh, yeah. small no. investors yeah. don't treat it like a business. And look at what this guy's saying. He's yeah. not looking at the existing house at all. He's looking at, to use your phrase, the opportunity that that property actually represents coming to it with not so much people like, you don't have to be creative. You just have to look at it as a property, nope. not as a dwelling. And when you look at the property, wow, there's room in back. I can have this structure that I can add to the back. Oh, look at there's a townhouse next exactly. door. I can change this into using what Alexandria did. Uh, if people go back and listen to her in early December. Antoinette. Antoinette. Antoinette, yes. Antoinette turned it into, you know, two units because of the zoning yes, allowed she did. it. So I uh, love that. Thanks for that, Lindsay. If you've got something for us, you've got either a video for us or you have a question for the show, where do people dive in there, Crystal? You dive only if you know how to swim. You dive <laughs> over to... <laughs> We'll help you swim. All right, just leave Doug the jokes is shaking for me. his head. Yeah, just come on. This is not amateur hour. That was hilarious. You dive into stackingdeeds.net slash voicemail. And we do want to hear your voice, so please leave us a voicemail. Or you can just send us a message and then we will answer your question or do an analysis just like we did for Lindsay. I think for those people who write in, I should read it and guess what their voice sounds like. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> just make up accents and what could go education wrong? Education levels. I have no idea what could go wrong. Can you be British? Oh, man. Be British Speaking one time, of, please. just horrible. Wow. As soon as we get a Nigel letter. Yes, everybody's absolutely sure that you're from across the pond. <laughs> yeah. Here's Good eye, Mike. A couple things. Thanks to all our Dieters helping us build the show. Obviously, it is fairly new, but we have gained some traction very quickly because of you and because of all the nice things you've said. If you've not said nice yes. things and you're not above helping somebody you've probably never met before, do even more at stuff that you like. Leave us a review. You're my kind of person. <laughs> Thank you so much for everybody Please. Everybody who's yes. done that. That helps our new Dieters find this real estate show. In the sea of a lot of shows which we love, listen to some of those crystals we were getting ready for this a lot of eye roll out there we're hoping to make something a little more mm -hmm. little, <laughs> a little kinder gentler a little a little more user-friendly yeah 
Yeah. User friendly. Yeah. So yeah. leave us a review. Leave us, hopefully, five stars. Love notes. And by the way, if you have a suggestion for the yeah. show, if you're not going to leave us a love note because there's something you think we could do better, write us. Joe at stackingbenjamins.com. Yeah, we want to hear it. You are Condo wanna... Crystal. Yes, at Condo Crystal in the Twitter and Instagram streets or just Crystal Hammond on the Facebooks. I'm old, so I still use the Facebooks. <laughs> the Facebooks. <laughs> it's be the... And I put an S... <laughs> Put an S on the end. You have to. The Facebooks. <laughs> she's obligated to do that. Yes. To show that she's mature. <laughs> that's what the mature among us do. Coming up next, we talked about ChatGPT. We're going to do ChatGPT next time. That should be some oh, yeah. fun. But Doug, I think you've got it from here. What's on our to-do list today? Well, Joe, the first thing you should do is take some advice from SUNY Rao. Work from a list of filters to purchase your next property. That way, you're not looking to fall in love with something that will treat you poorly. Instead, you're purchasing doors that will love you long time. Thought that sounded good? No? I'm leaving it in. Second, hearing headlines about how it's a great time to rent, remember that you're on the other side of the equation now. When you're talking to prospective renters, emphasize that they're making a great decision by renting from you. But the big lesson? Don't even try to explain to Ruth exactly how you capture oxygen on the moon to create your own moon colony. That lady doesn't understand basic science. Thanks to Suni Rao for joining us today. You can find out more about her work at at Suni Rao. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingdeeds.net. So just go there and you can find everything you need. 